Welcome to the Winning in Real Estate podcast with your host and CEO of Align Ventures, Arnold Olszewski. Join us as we speak with real estate pros about their experiences and learn the fundamentals of passive real estate investing. Together, we will unlock the secrets of achieving financial freedom by discussing proven strategies and building passive income through investing in real estate. Here's your host, Arnold Olszewski. Welcome to the Winning in Real Estate podcast. As always, I'm your host, Arnold Olshansky, and joining me today is David Auerbach. David is a former 20-year-plus institutional trader with a primary focus in REITs. Currently, he is the managing director at Armada ETF Advisors, a company investing in publicly traded real estate investment trusts. David currently holds a FINRA Series 7, 24, 55, and 63 registrations. In today's episode, we will discuss REITs, how they work, the pros and cons, and whether it's an investment vehicle worth pursuing. David, welcome to the show. Arnold, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Likewise. I want to jump right into something I came across. I know your father was a CPA and how much of an impact he had on you going into the world of finance and investing. Can you tell us a little more about your story and and what effect your dad had on your career? Great question to start out with, and I, I can't wait to share this with him. He'll be so flattered that he was the first question out the shoot. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm a unique character, as you'll figure out by the end of this episode. And at a very young age, like five years old, six years old, as kids are usually sitting there watching cartoons, I was watching business news. And the reason why was my father as a CPA used to bring home the Wall Street Journal every single day. And my father used to, uh, let's say, collect newspapers where we would have stacks and stacks and stacks of Wall Street Journals, which drove my mother absolutely back crazy. But my father opened the paper for me one day and he was like, check out these stock tables. This was back when the newspapers used to publish stock tables every single day. And he was showing me like, here's Disney, here's the Boston Celtics when they used to be publicly traded. And as I was looking at it, there was one that just one number that just jumped out the most of anything. And it wound up being Berkshire Hathaway because its stock price at the time compared to all the other ones, even today, all the other numbers in the table, it just wasn't even close. And so I asked my father, is this a typo? Like, what's wrong with this? Like, that looks weird. And of course, my father knew who Warren Buffett was. And he was like, oh, this is this is a great story. You need to learn about this guy. And so at six years old, learning about Berkshire Hathaway, not knowing anything about the company besides the expensive stock price, I found myself watching CNN every single morning with Stuart Varney back, again, this is, we're talking mid-1980s, late 1980s, before CNBC even existed. And, you know, every single morning I was watching the ticker and I was watching the guys in the crowd doing the hand signals and all that stuff. And like something clicked in me and I'm like, I want to do this when I grow up. Um, we all remember Ferris Bueller, the movie, and they go to the Chicago Board of Trade and the options pits, and they see all the guys doing the hand motions or uh, trading places with Eddie Murphy. Same thing, the guys in the commodity pits all doing the hand signals. And there was just something about that buzz, that electricity, that just, again, as a kid, I'm like, wow, that looks really cool. I was lucky. I knew going through junior high and high school and college what I wanted to do. And, you know, my father being exposed to finance, having clients in the financial world, doing taxes, all that fun stuff, it was just a natural compliment for me. When you fast forward through my years in college, in my junior year, my father had a former partner of his that was renting space out of his office. And this was, again, back in a unique time when nobody was doing this where CPAs were basically doing CPA and investment management practices. Now they're fairly common. You see a lot of them doing it. This wasn't so prevalent back again in the the mid nineties. And my father was like, you got to talk to Scott. Scott was the guy's name. Scott, we'd love to have you. You can learn. And like from that point, I was hooked. Scott was a retail advisor. And so for me, it was cool to, you know, get my licenses, learn about the markets, actually being involved in the market for a full period of the day. You know, remember as a college student, you'd come in, you turn on the news and you'd run out to your next class or your next party or whatever. 
but obviously having a day-to-day vested interest in Mary Smith's portfolio because my partner just recommended she buy Intel. Intel's coming out with earnings today, and this is back in the day when, as you remember, there's that consensus estimate, but then there was also that whisper estimate. It was one thing for you to hit consensus, but if you didn't hit whisper, the stocks would sell off and they would rally if you killed the whisper number. And so, you know, for us to have a thesis, stand by it, reach out to Mary when the earnings came out, realizing how hands-on that approach was with the customer, like it all just resonated with me. And again, it all started with my father. And so I was very lucky that he, you know, pointed me in this direction because I can tell you now, I can't imagine, no offense to CPAs that listen to this, please take no offense. When you're a CPA and you're doing tax season and you're sitting at your desk from 5 a.m. until 6 p.m. at night and you're going through tax returns, it's the same thing over and over. It's just different numbers. But yet on Wall Street, today is a perfect example. On a Fed announcement day, life was different at uh, 1.58 p.m. Eastern than it was at 2.02 p.m. Eastern after the Fed had already made their announcement. And it was even more different at 2.30 Eastern when Chairman Powell starts making his comments and you see the tape go like this and everything is moving. But that's so cool. When you're on Wall Street, no two minutes are alike. You don't know what's going to happen that's going to send the market skyrocketing or going to the hell. And it's just so fun to be a part for that ride. You know, I, I love that story. You, you told me that by the end of this call, I'd find you to be a unique character. I would say by the end of the first question, I, I probably reached that destination. Uh, <laughs> just at, well, reading the, the Wall Street Journal at five years old. I mean, I... I someone could relate, you know. Uh, Not like I understood 90% sure, of the sure. stuff I read. No, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, I, I still mean, don't understand 90% of the stuff in the journal because it's outside my world. But still. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we just get the, what we need to know. But yeah, no, I, I could relate. I, you know, um, we came here to America when I was five years old. And I remember first seeing Manhattan and I would just be driving around with my mom and dad. And I'm like, mom, dad, I'm going to work in that building. And I'm pointing to the highest skyscrapers I could see. Uh, so I, I didn't go as far as reading the Wall Street Journal yet, but somewhat similar experience. But you knew, but you had a goal. You had yeah, a goal. I'm going to be absolutely. in this building and you found yourself in this building. Now, I never worked on the floor. I worked with guys on the floor. I went and visit. I'll never forget the first time that I went and visited the New York Stock Exchange. I was 20 returning 24. Uh, I was an institutional trader for a firm in Dallas. Uh, when we talk about REITs, we'll get into it. And I, I literally got chills walking on the exchange and hearing the phones ringing and all that stuff and seeing Maria stand in the crowd and all the stuff that I had seen on TV for so many years, like literally still like, you know, the hair standing up in my arm. And it's funny because the floor today is completely different than it was back then. The floor is basically not, when I call the floor, I mean the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, The floor is just non-existent really today versus what it was back then. The only time that you see the floor crowded is when they ring the opening bell and they ring the closing bell. If you're there from, let's say, 1030 Eastern until 3 Eastern, 245, 3 Eastern, it's a ghost town. Yeah, there's people manning the booths and they answer the phones, but it's not as crazy as what it looks like what you're seeing on TV. But even still today, when I walk on the floor and I go see buddies or I have an event down there, I still get those same chills like I did that first time because I see six-year-old self me looking up at me like, oh my gosh, you got to live your dream. You're at, I call it the New York Stock Exchange, it's Mecca. I'm like, you're at Mecca, you, you're at your home. And like and people, you know, I'm literally, I have a s eating grin ear to ear when I'm walking out there because like it's the coolest place on earth. Well, your passion resonates through the mic. So thank you. I'm a believer. So to jump into REITs a little, yeah, right. For those that may not be familiar with REITs as an investment vehicle, just high level, what is a REIT? How do they work? It's great. Before I even get into this, I want to start out asking you a question. I'm going to turn it back on you. Arnold, you're in New York, land of REIT Central. So let me ask you a question. Have you gone to Starbucks recently and had a cup of coffee? Got one right here. Have you been to CVS or Walgreens or in your neck of the woods, Dwayne Reed, to pick up a prescription or anything recently? Two days ago. A little bit different for you in New York than, let's say, your average person that lives in Lexington, Kentucky. But have you gone to the grocery store and bought groceries recently? I have a delivery app for that. See, again, it's different when you're in New York City versus everywhere else in the country. 
Well, right. the reason why I use those three questions is we're interacting with the read on property. Now, let me give you another question. Do you have a cell phone? Sure. Do you have Amazon on your cell phone? No. Damn. I don't. <laughs> well, a lot of people have the Amazon app on their cell phone. Okay. Well, I'm just being honest. I would have it on my phone. The reason I don't have it on my phone is I don't want to go into that rabbit hole and have my assistant order whatever I need. So Can't but otherwise, you. I'd have it. <laughs> but the reason why I mentioned that is think about you take your cell phone, you open the Amazon app, you order a set of headphones on the app. The order gets processed through a data center. It hits an industrial warehouse who processes the order and it shows up on your doorstep the next day. And every single example I've given you from the Starbucks to the delivery of that package, you're interacting with a REIT-owned property. So REITs are every, everywhere and you're using it every single part of the day, whether you believe it or not, whether you realize that you're involved with the REIT or not. Us doing this conversation right now, we're using REITs, which is the coolest thing. Because again, a lot of this flows through a cell phone tower. If we're on a cell phone, again, goes through the cloud, which is all managed through the data centers. But we're using REITs 24-7 of our lives. A REIT is basically just a tax structure. It's a tax pass-through vehicle. And why I mention that is an apartment owner, apartment landlord like MidAmerica or Avalon Bay owns apartments and they're a REIT. But it's not the same thing as Empire State Realty Trust in New York City who owns the Empire State Building. And Empire State Realty Trust which owns a bunch of other office buildings up in that area, New York City and the surrounding uh, states up there. But that's also a REIT. But the valuation metrics for office REITs are completely different than apartment REITs. And what does an apartment in San Francisco, California have to do with a data center that's in Billings, Montana? And the answer is absolutely nothing whatsoever. The only thing that they have in common is that they are owned by REIT companies. So a REIT is a tax structure. The cool thing, the, to sum it very uh, succinctly, 90% of the net taxable income, basically uh, assets minus liabilities minus all this other stuff equals net income. 90% of that net income gets passed back to shareholders in the form of dividends. So from a very high level, you write to the apartment landlord your rent check. The rent check covers the expenses and all that stuff. They pool up all the rent that's collected from the tenants in the apartment building. Whatever is left at the bottom of the day, 90% of that gets passed through to shareholders in the form of dividend. So it doesn't matter if it's an apartment building, an office building, a self-storage property, a cell tower, or, you know, again, every single one of these examples, there's about 18 to 20 subsectors of the REIT industry. We can go into any of them and all of them. But what's happening is that income that's being generated from the operations of those companies, so the ownership and management of those properties is being paid to shareholders in the form of dividend income. That's a great example. So th there's dividends. So it's th there's cash flow that it's producing. In terms of appreciation, is there that component to this investment vehicle? Well, yeah, because most so there's several different types of REITs. There's the publicly traded REITs that I deal with every single day that are in our funds, and we'll talk about that. There's private REITs, some of the largest sponsors like Blackstone and Starwood and KKR that are they're publicly registered, but they're privately owned and they don't trade on an exchange. There's unlisted. So, I mean, there's different classes of REITs. But to answer your question, yes, there can be appreciation. It depends on the market cycle and the day-to-day -day fluctuations that are in the market. The publicly traded REITs obviously trade on the exchanges. They're in the all the S&P indices, the S&P 500, all the way down to the Russell 2000, some of the smallest companies that are out there. But they're all exchange traded. And so you are... You know, like, oh, it's like owning tech stocks, you know, in the late 90s into the early 2000s. I'm not equating REITs to tech stocks. What I'm saying is it didn't matter what you were in 1995. If you had something to do with internet or tech, your stock price went straight up to the roof. To the roof. With REITs, there's 200 publicly traded REITs that are out there. There's mortgage REITs. There's equity REITs. There's, again, non-traded. So with so many different classes that are out there, it really pays to understand what type of REIT vehicle you're investing in. And more importantly, 
what properties or things does this company do? Know, you know, what, know what drives that motor down the road. Sure. I want to touch on one point that you mentioned, right? REITs pay out 90% of their income in the form of dividends, which from my understanding is then taxed as ordinary income. Correct. Would investing through an IRA be more beneficial for those looking to invest into a REIT for the long term? So the answer from a very high level is yes, absolutely. There's great data from NARI, the National Association of Real Estate Investment Trust. Their website is REIT.com, R-E-I-T.com. I recommend any and all listeners go check out their website because they have a fantastic educational platform that's on the website. But one of the things that they show when you talk about this REIT dividend income, now remember, I'm using a very high level example. Not everything always works out this way. Everything's a hypothetical disclosure, compliance, blah, blah, blah. What they're trying to pose in one of these charts is what they tell you is, let's say you're 18 years old. You're out of college, you have a summer job, you earn your paycheck, you're putting it into an IRA, you're starting investing for your future. And let's say you put money into a REIT portfolio. You buy realty income, you buy agree realty, uh, some of these monthly dividend payers, whatever it is. You buy a high yielding REIT, whatever. The sooner you start putting money into REITs, the further out you are away from retirement through dividend reinvestment and stock price appreciation, the portfolio that has REITs versus doesn't have REITs in it. You could be talking, again, if you use that 18-year-old example over the course of, let's say, 50 years until you retire, you could be talking about seven figures of income to the bottom line, all because you have this additional exposure to REIT owned properties. So REITs are, uh, REITs are really, I have to be careful as I say this, REITs are a great way to boost the income of your portfolio over the long-term investment horizon. When I say long-term, I'm talking 25, 50 years, generational wealth, passing it to the next generation, your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids. Because as you let these companies do what they do best and you keep earning this dividend income, that appreciates over the course, again, of 50 plus years, plus that stock price appreciation, which will hopefully mean higher dividend income down the road, as well as the operations continue to grow, you could be talking some serious cash flow that's flowing to the bottom line way down that road. Right. And then taking that money, reinvesting it, and then obviously the principle of compounding starts to take effect. Correct. And again, because you're doing an IRA vehicle, you're minimizing your tax exposure. Mm. Yeah, very, uh, you know, and you, you talk about what what kind of a difference it makes in a portfolio that's, let's just say, all stocks and, and bonds. It, you, we're talking, you know, seven-figure differences at, at the end of, you know, by the time you're ready to retire. What are the underlying mechanisms? What 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 is it that, that pushes the needle so much? Well, I, I want to go back to take it real quick. At 18 years old, who the hell wants to invest in REITs? I want to invest in Tesla. I want to invest in Bitcoin. I want to invest in GameStop. Like that's, again, I'm, I'm not knocking today's 18-year-old. What I'm saying is REITs aren't on that person's mind at that time. And so even an advisor, you know, who's sitting down with the family is probably not going to tell an 18-year-old, hey, man, you need to start buying REITs today, I'm telling you. But, but the difference is also fast forward to, let's say, 60. And you know you're going to be retiring in 5, 10 years. And think about how your investment philosophy shifts from an 18-year-old kid to a mid-50, 60-year-old person. You're obviously not taking on as much risk. You're focusing on retirement. How can I make sure I have all that money there for me when I retire so that I, you know, I don't have to go get another job because I ran out of my money? And right. why I mentioned this is when you get towards those years of your life, well, then your portfolio naturally shifts from risk on to risk off, which means then you're taking in more of these income producing investments in your portfolio, a la commodities, treasuries, utilities, REITs. Again, those dividend income paying vehicles are what you're going to ride through retirement. Ideally, in the perfect world, you know, everybody has a number. You know, you know what I mean when I say everybody has a number. Absolutely. You've Absolutely. got a magic number. With you in New York, it probably is a lot more than that person that's in Eagle River, Wisconsin. But what I'm getting at is, let's say you've got a portfolio of 10 million bucks. 
And yet you are able to structure the portfolio so that you generate interest and dividend income of $250,000 a year without touching that $10 million principal balance. You can, I don't know if you can live on 250 in New York. I'm sure you can, but you can, you know, again, the goal is to live off of the dividends and income principal that you're generating without ever touching the original capital investment that you put into the fund or that you've grown over time. Sure, sure. And I feel like this ties into a philosophy of yours that you talked about on previous shows. And, and that's slow and steady wins the race. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on that philosophy? Man, Arno, I like you. You did your homework, so kudos to you. <laughs> I like to say that the REITs are the tortoise and the tortoise and the hare of your portfolio. Slow and steady wins the race. We see too many stories about high-flying stories like Bitcoin, some of the ARC ETFs, GameStop. You know, we, we see the flash in the pan name of, you know, and again, I think it's a great company, but another example would be like NVIDIA today. Everybody loves NVIDIA. What's going to happen when NVIDIA comes crashing back down to earth, right? Who knows when and if that's going to happen. So that's, that's like that risk on type of stuff. Absolutely. The slow and steady part, again, talking about what we were talking about, the one-year apartment lease, the five-year rent that CBS has in place with the net lease operator where the rent increases are tied to CPI. And so they can kind of forecast what those rental rate increases are going to be. We know the rent's going to go up 5% every year over the course of the five years. So from year one to year five, our rent will be up 25% from year one by the end of year five, whatever it is. We know what the outlook looks like. You sign an office lease. I'm going to be in this lease for three years. The rent escalator looks like this every single year, whatever. Pick this. You go stay at a hotel. You know what the one-night hotel rate looks like. We know what what some of these REIT numbers look like. Again, slow and steady. You're paying that rent every month. You're paying that rent every year, whatever it is. That's that slow and steady. So sit back, let these companies do what they do best. You collect this dividend income, and it's this dividend income that lets you go out and play the Teslas, the Apples, the higher risk, more active stuff in that portfolio. So I call it the left side versus the right side of the portfolio. Left side, slow and steady. Right side, risk on. Let's slow and steady do its thing all day for the next 25, 50 years so that you can play around with the right side to really try to take, you know, hyper growth your portfolio. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I'm a big, but whenever I speak with investors, I'm a big believer that left side and right side changes as you go through life, right? When, when you're 18 and 20 or 25, right, you could take more risk because you have more time to recover if something doesn't go right. But when you're 50 or 60 years old, Right. You, you should be a little maybe towards the safer side, because if you just put all your money in Bitcoin, well, it's going to be hard to go start building more businesses and restart your whole career at 60 years old. So it's, it's a good philosophy to also keep in mind where am I at in life currently and what risk am I willing to take? And I believe the answer to that question changes constantly. I think you're absolutely right. And that's why, again, thinking of that slow and steady wins the race. You know, I remember when I was born, my grandmother bought me or my grandfather bought me a share of IBM, a share of Disney and put me in a dividend reinvestment program. And, you know, from, from the time I was born until I was 22 or whatever, and I cashed out the trade, you know, I basically made a few shares of stock without doing anything. Imagine if you could take a portfolio of 10, let's say, monthly dividend paying REITs and put it in a custodial account for your newborn child that was born last month and just let the, if, if assuming they have dividend reinvestment programs. And imagine what that portfolio looks like from the day that that child was born to when they retire at 65 by just letting that stuff do what it does best. I mean, that kid's gonna have a great head start on retirement compared to anybody else. Yeah, you just mentioned uh, considering they have a dividend reinvestment program. Does that mean that some REITs don't allow you to reinvest the dividends or no, I'm not I'm not saying that necessarily. Like some do highlight that they have a dividend reinvestment plan, a drip plan okay. where you can sign up for it. Your advisor, your stock platform, if you use Fidelity, E-Trade, et cetera, they may give you the option to do that as well. 
So you really have to check on a company by company basis. Off the top of my head, I don't know which companies do allow you and don't allow you to, but if you are able to reinvest those dividends, because from here's a very high level example. And you've heard me use this before. Stock is trading at $20 a share. This company pays out an annual $2 dividend. You'll recoup your cost of the investment in the company in 10 years just from dividend income alone, not talking about any upside appreciation of that stock. So again, think about that newborn that we were talking about, you know, for him to make $20 of dividend income in 10 years of just letting this company do its thing, you know, that again, that's going to add up very quickly. Sure. In terms of diversification, want to touch on that a little bit. For me in the stock market, I, I like indexes, right? I like the S&P 500. I like mid, mid cap, large cap because industries change, right? There's industry disruptors, but when you're in an index, you're, you're diversified. You know, you don't have just all your money, let's say for example, in office, right? So if something like COVID happens, so are there any particular strategies that you would tell investors or advise investors on to obtain diversification when investing in a REIT? Are there particular REITs out there that provide more diversification than others? Great question that you bring, and it's obviously some really good points that you've raised there. Diversification is always important across your portfolio, across your REIT portfolio. To never put your, all your eggs in one basket. Uh, look at our ETFs that we're running. We're running an ETF of residential REITs, but it's covered across many different sectors and many different geographies across the country. Our other fund is taking REITs in industrials and data centers and a lot of other sectors that are out there. You know, there's single stock ETF products that are on the market by a single stock ETF of Tesla or Apple as an example. And that's geared more for like that day trading type of audience that wants to take advantage of news or earnings or something that's going on out there. If you're going to do a portfolio diversification on a company level, you know, one of the things that the office guys spoke at at a conference not too long ago was that take your typical New York office guy we were talking about before. They are not pure play office. That New York office guy is his office. He's retail because there's ground floor retail. He's tourist because again of that observatory, they're, we're bringing in tourists to come check out our property. There could be a residential component or a hotel component inside one of these office buildings. So they're taking revenue streams from many different sources, if you think about it, versus it's just, we have 25 office tenants, they're paying us X in rent, that's our revenue stream. Nope, it's more than that. I personally think, you know, again, if you were going to build out a portfolio, I think there's like 32 REITs in the S&P 500 right now. And if you just bought the 32 REITs in the S&P 500, you would have a pretty good diversified portfolio of just the REITs, if that makes sense. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of uh, index ETFs that are out there. We can talk about the largest passive REIT index ETFs like VNQ and IYR, and we can go through their pros and cons. From a very high level, though, you mentioned about that indexing component. Let's bring COVID back into the picture again. If you were sitting in VNQ in one of these passive vehicles during COVID, you were sitting there holding offices and hotels and malls and the sectors that you didn't want to be in while also having exposure to cell phone, uh, cell towers, data centers, and industrial, the sectors that you did want to be in. When that semi-annual rebalance came up during COVID, guess what? You were still owning offices and hotels and malls and the stuff that you didn't want to be in, while also still owning that other desirable stuff. So Absolutely. there is a big difference between the active versus passive, whereas the active guy would be like, no, 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 we're going to get rid of this stuff and we're going to focus on the stronger sectors. but. You know, again, it's, I think it's very important for any investor that's listening to this, no matter what it is that they own, know what's under the hood of the car, what's inside that passive index ETF that you own. Because again, what does Jones Lang LaSalle as an office broker have anything to do again with that data center that's in Dallas, Texas? And the answer is absolutely nothing. But they're all lumped in that same wrapper together. Right. So speaking of what's underneath the hood, it's a perfect segue to something I, I'm very curious about. It's let, let's just say new to REITs, right? And I want to go and I want to start exploring which ones to invest in. As somebody that's, that's new to this as an investment vehicle, what are some of the things that you would recommend looking at in order to underwrite it, in order to understand which one is offering the best value 
Are there some metric stats, just particular things that you feel should be zoomed in on? First things first, I always say invest with your eyes. Look at the properties with your eyes. Start in your backyard. Start in your backyard where you live. You live in Naples, Florida. You live in Huntington Beach, California. Look with your eyes. Look at the property. That's what I call the intersection of Maine and Maine. Your two biggest streets that cross paths in the city. And, you know, in New York, there could be pretty much any midtown Manhattan intersection, right? Sure. In far north Dallas, for me here, it's near section of Park and Preston, let's say. You know, in L.A., it's Beverly and Wilshire. You know, again, some of these famous intersections that we have that cross paths. Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. I'm not saying that's like the intersection, but a famous cross street. Look at the property that's there. What does it look like? Does it look nice? New coat of paint? Full parking lot? Does the sign work at night? Is it well lit? What's the foot traffic like inside the building? A great example, go walk through your local mall. Go walk through your local mall at two o'clock on a Tuesday if you can. Is it, crowd? Is it crowded? How crowds the parking lot? Do the stores look busy? What about the food court? What about all the other stuff that's there? And why I use this as an example is it, I say it gets the hamster wheel spinning. So we'll take it to my neck of the woods here. There's a REIT called Bricksmore. They own shopping centers. Bricksmore has a property that's five minutes north of where I'm sitting right now. And it has a Mid-America apartment, MAA, one of our apartment REITs, just on the other side of it. And so right there, I'm able to look at two different REIT-owned properties every single day that I drive by it. I drove by it twice in the past, in the past two days. But I see the property. It's, a, it's at a well-lit intersection, full traffic, full parking lot, couple of stores available, you know, but the tenants are moving in. And so I say to myself, who owns that property? Bricksmore owns that property. Mid-America owns that apartment property. Really? Wow, that's a really nice property. I wonder what else they own. And you go on the website, you see that they own a property that's, let's say, 10 minutes away from your house. But you know that intersection very well. You know that that's a desirable area to be in. Wow, where else do they own? And then you start, that hamster wheel starts spinning. You're like, wow, I want to go check out this. And oh my gosh, look, they have this much foot traffic at this population. The average income in this one mile circle is $275,000. I mean, again, something extreme. But like, wow, I need to go check this out. So it all starts with investing with your eyes. Look, feel, see, touch, smell. If I can do all of that in my own backyard, then I'm able to start that learning process. Not everybody cares about FFO, AFFO, NAV, all these buzzwords that you get here, you know, here kicking around by the REIT guys themselves and the analysts. I think it all boils down to you, the investor. What matters to you, the investor, is different than what matters to the analyst, if that makes sense. And what I'm saying is you and I are two different investors. What makes a stock a buy to you could make a stock a sell to me and vice versa. But what we do like is, you know, full parking lot and a a breed owned property. We like seeing all the signs lit up and the grocery stores always humming along. Like that gets us excited because we know, wow, that place is a moneymaker. Okay, the anchor tenant is Whole Foods. Well, Amazon owns Whole Foods. Are they in danger of closing this Whole Foods anytime soon? Yeah, so that's how you start thinking about, well, we have Albertsons and, Tom, and Albertsons and Safeway merging or whoever it is. How many of my local stores are going to be closed based off of this merger? Who's going to come in and fill that anchor space? Like use another example, Bed Bath. We talked about Bed Bath closures. You know, everybody's talking about Bed Bath. Meanwhile, all the Bed Bath spaces have been basically already released. Like that, that anchor space is in demand and they have tenants coming in to fill these spaces. So again, another question. How long has that anchor tenant been vacant? You have a mall in your backyard that has Kmart, Sears, and JCPenney as its anchor tenants, and two of the three guys are dark. How long until they fill that property? And so that's how I kind of start thinking about when I, if I'm looking at REITs from a very high level, is start looking at the, you know, what's in your backyard, let that, you know, see something that you like, look them up, see what else they own, where else they're on. Like for us, we have this fun PRBT. We're replicating some of the private REITs. And why I mention this is that these private REIT uh, companies have assembled Class A portfolios in Class A markets 
at class A intersections, like the best of the best at the best. And they put it all in one wrapper, you know, one private wrapper for investors. But the publicly traded guys own some of the best of the best in some of the best of the best markets at some of the best of the best intersections. Why can't you own that same property as well? That's such great and practical advice, right? Just invest with your eyes, right? Use, ask those common sense questions, right? Uh, how is this property being ran? And a lot of times if that property's being ran poorly, you could start making assumptions. Well, if this is how they run one. It's uh, very likely that they're and running I, other properties I want to emphasize poorly. one more point. Remember, we're talking publicly traded REITs, which means they are covered by a bunch of analysts. So chances are, if you are, um, if you are uh, a Merrill Lynch client, you will have access to Merrill Lynch's REIT research. And you would call your advisor and be like, hey, advisor, I see that Kimco owns this shopping center down the street. I love I love the shopping center. I'm there every week. I take my grandkid to go buy a donut there. I'm at the grocery store every week. We spend a lot of our time at this shopping center. I want to learn more about Kimco. Well, Bob, I'm sorry. We have a sell rating on Kimco here. Well, why do you guys have a sell rating on it? Oh, well, because of blah, 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 blah. I don't care about that. I just want to know how much money are they bringing in? What's their dividend? Like, again, each investor has something different that causes it to be a buy, sell, or a hold but focus on the operation itself. Let me ask you this question. Let's say I'm traveling somewhere. I walk into a mall that I feel is just magnificently ran. How would I go about trying to reverse engineer to find out which REIT might potentially own that? And, and would that even be something people should kind of keep their eyes open about. Like, but whenever you're around something that you feel is performing very well in, in a real estate environment, to be able to reverse engineer that and then start researching the read itself, would you say that's a, a potential strategy as well? There's many a times I will go into Google and say, who owns X? And, and Google will point me towards who that owner is. So the answer is, Yes, Google is your friend. You know, I, I'm not afraid to ask, you know, who owns the Empire State Building? Well, dummy, it's the Empire State Realty Trust. Okay, what else do they own? You go to their website, you see what else is in that portfolio. So yeah, you can easily reverse engineer it. Now, if it's in private hands, if it's privately owned, mom and pop owned, you may not be able to, frankly, own it. But if it's publicly owned, yeah, you can ask Google and Google will tell you where it is and what the ticker is and all that fun stuff. I feel like that's something that I'm, I'll personally try myself. Uh, walk around, see office buildings that I feel are being ran very well, or I just, just asking how occupied are you? Arnold, I'm not exaggerating. I do it at least once a week. At really? least once a week, wow. I'm asking Google who owns this property. Or like I'll see an article about a shopping center and it doesn't tell you who the owner is. It'll show up in my REIT news, but it doesn't tell you who the REIT is in the article. I'm like, well, who owns... Madisonville Plaza. Oh, it's owned by Franklin Street. Okay, boom. Now I know that who owns that property. Sure. So then, then let's say you, you find this property and, and you looked at it with your eyes. You see that it has the foot traffic. It's being ran well. It, uh, if it's, a, let's say, office or residential, it's fully occupied. Uh, they have a strong anchor tenant and other things. After that, you know, I'm assuming you're looking at what dividends are they paying? And uh, are there any other factors that you really want to put emphasis on? So from a very high level, I can't control company stock prices. I can't control my stock prices for my two funds. It's, it's, I have nothing to do with it. I will say, though, from a very high level, you as the end investor, pick any stock, REIT, not a REIT, Apple, Tesla, whatever. At the end of the day, you as the investor want that company to do four, you want them to do a lot of things, but really it's boiled down to four things and only four things. You want them to grow revenues, grow profits, grow dividends, and grow guidance, grow their netting, you know, grow what they're going to do year over year. If a company is able to do those four things, ignoring stock price performance, you would assume the fundamentals remain pretty strong for that company slash sector slash industry. So if we use that Bricksmore example, if I know that the rents are going up, which means that the revenues are going up, 
which hopefully means their net income is going up, which hopefully means their profit is going up, and hopefully that means dividends and, and annual guidance increases as well, then I would assume that Bricksmore is on solid. You can get lost in the numbers very quickly by reading an analyst report. And again, when I do my conversations, I, tr- I try to reflect this if I'm talking to grandma and grandpa who's in the retirement community, the villages. Grandma and grandpa don't care what the price to FFO ratio is of Bricksmore versus Kimco. They care about what's the stock price, what's the performance been, what's the dividend structure look like, why should I care about this over the other? So again, it kind of goes back to know your customer. If I'm talking to Cohen and Steers, you know who Cohen and Steers is, that conversation with Cohen and Steers would be much, much different than talking to grandma and grandpa as the example. Makes a lot of sense. I want to touch a little bit on your fund. Can you share with us what you guys currently have, have going on and some of the things that you guys are targeting? Sure. So we have two funds. Our first one is House, the Residential REIT ETF. It's 25 publicly traded REITs focused on apartments, uh, single family rentals, manufactured housing, and senior housing. When we built the fund, we built it, it was kind of came together during COVID as we saw this mass migration of people moving across the country and really not being able to buy a house. And so for us, we realized, well, with all these people relocating to Austin, Texas, for example, which of the residential REIT companies and sectors would benefit from this relocation? So we positioned a portfolio that was geared towards, you know, Sunbelt, single family rental heavy exposure towards the coast because we're seeing the comeback there. But really, where are people moving across the country and which of the residential REIT segments are benefiting from that relocation? The goal is to obviously focus the puck on the highest demand markets, which hopefully capture the highest rental growth, which hopefully translates to the highest dividend income that's being paid by these guys. Our second fund just launched yesterday, like literally yesterday. It's the private real estate strategy by a liquid REITs ETF. The ticker is PRVT. The long and the short is, I mentioned some of the large private REIT players that are out there, Starwood, Blackstone, KKR. We respect the portfolios that these guys have built. They have really smart management teams. And what we did was we took the portfolios of these largest private REIT vehicles and in a 50-name publicly traded REIT basket, we brought together a more liquid, lower cost ETF vehicle that trades at current daily market valuations. So we're getting that private REIT allocation at current market valuations of what we're seeing in the stock market. And that's, that covers, again, the same residential, single apartment, single family rentals, gaming, net lease, self-storage, data centers, I uh, mentioned industrial, some healthcare, but it's, again, a, a bigger sleeve to uh, play as these private vehicles are, again, assembling Class A portfolios and Class A markets at the intersections of Maine and Maine, you know, some of the most desirable assets that are out there. Sounds like a very interesting investment model. And it, it seems like you guys have outlined, th- did a lot of research on on what to target to our listeners. We'll make sure that we have all of David's uh, contact information in our show notes if if you'd like to find more about some of the funds that they currently have going. David, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to jump into our closing questions. And the first one is, what is your number one rule for success in life and in business? I was asked this question very similarly on a podcast very recently, and uh, it didn't take me long to answer it. It's not going to take me long here. There's more things in life than having money in the bank. Success is being happy. I always say, if you're not happy, you'll never be successful. There are people that make nothing that are the happiest people on earth. There are people that make all the money in the world and the most miserable, upset people on earth. And so I think for me and personally to be successful in life and in business, you got to be happy. Love it. And I couldn't agree with you more. I see it almost on a daily basis myself. People that you think have everything. And it's as if they have nothing and vice versa. If there was one piece of advice that you can give to somebody to help them on their investing journey, what would that be? Network. Get out there, ask questions. I know what I know, and there's a lot that I don't know. And that which I don't know, I try to surround myself with smarter people that know a lot more than I do. I was, I was taught at a very young age, and I still teach it 
every time I can. And it's why I left uh, that advisor when I was 22 when I first got my licenses. Networking is a 24-7 gig. There is no set time in the day of, okay, I'm going to start networking now. I'm going to turn it off. If I get a phone call from somebody watching this at 2 o'clock from Asia in the morning, and he's a prospective lead that somebody I want to talk to, you can bet your ass I'm going to take that call at 2 o'clock in the morning. and might be awake. I don't know. But networking is a 24-7 gig. So I would always, you know, get out there and ask questions. Don't be afraid to approach management teams. Don't be afraid to call investor relations of one of these REITs. That's their job is to answer your questions. Don't be afraid to call me. I may not know the answer. I may have to find the answer. But don't be afraid to network and reach out and ask, you know, people that know more than you questions. They may not know the answers. But the fact that you're showing that engagement that you want to learn more, anybody's going to respect that. Great advice. And David, how can our listeners reach you? Very simple. My email address is dauerbach, A-U-E-R-B-A-C-H, at Armada, which you see back here, ETFS.com. So dauerbach at Armada, ETFs.com. I'm also very active on LinkedIn. My handle is David Auerbach. You should be able to find my page. And I'm also on Twitter. I'm the daily read beat on Twitter for anybody who is a Twitter follower. David, I want to thank you for joining us today. I must say that your passion for what you do resonates and it's infectious. And I believe you shared a great, great content today that people can really take an action on. So for that, I, I thank you and I'm sure our listeners will appreciate it. Thank you, Arnold. This was fantastic. And uh, I can't wait to hopefully do this again with you one day. Awesome. Winning in Real Estate listener, thank you for joining. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star review. Share this podcast with somebody you think can benefit from it. And also, don't forget to follow and subscribe. If you would like to become a better real estate investor, make sure to download the Passive Investor's Guide to Analyzing a Real Estate Syndication Deal. This comprehensive ebook equips investors with the tools to evaluate deals and avoid common mistakes gain insights, strategies, and practical advice to make better investment decisions. Download your copy today at investav.com forward slash ebook, or you can find the link in our show notes. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are provided for informational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any securities or to make or consider any investment or course of action. 